Uh, thanks for coming, everyone, right after lunch and on a Friday afternoon. Um, before I get into the talk, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, this is kind of um, for Noah Glurl's 50th anniversary. I just want to say I've been kind of doubly blessed in my career in that I did my PhD at the Freshwater Institute in Canada, which was this building full of aquatic scientists. And it was just the best place in the world to do a PhD. And after that, um, in fact, here's my PhD supervisor walking in right now. Um, good timing, Bob. <laughs> so uh, working there was just a great place to do a PhD, just a, a, you know dozens of aquatic scientists in the same building. And then from there, I went to Noah Gluro where I did a postdoc, which was kind of the same thing, this building just full of aquatic scientists. And so I couldn't have asked for two better places to start my career. And it's really had a big influence ever since then on the way I think about my science and also on the relationships that I have in the scientific community. So I think, you know, it's still great to see that Noah Gloral, along with Sigler, is doing so much work to support undergraduate and graduate and postdoctoral students, and I hope uh, they can continue to do that. Um, I'm going to be giving a, a presentation on work we've been doing for quite a few years on mussels in Lake Michigan. Uh, this is going to be specifically about some work that um, one of my undergraduate or my graduate students was doing looking at uh, phosphorus cycling by uh, deep mussels. Um, back in the early 2000s, one of my previous grad students did some work looking at phosphorus recycling by mussels and came up with numbers like this. And she was measuring both um, excretion, which is dissolved phosphorus release, but also ingestion, which is basically biodeposits and looking at the phosphorus and biodeposits. And what she saw and what you can see here is that biodeposits make up a significant portion, up to 50%, of the phosphorus that's released by mussels. So they're eating this stuff and about almost half of what they're eating is coming out as biodeposits. And yet there wasn't much information on what happens to those biodeposits. So uh, Ray Ann, uh, the, the more recent graduate student, she's decided to follow up on that and look at um, recycling of these biodeposits. Uh, so you can see on the left, she first started with experiments getting deep water quaggas and then doing experiments on the ship immediately after collecting the quaggas, um, incubating in the, them at in situ temperature to look at excretion of dissolved phosphorus, as well as ingestion of uh, biodeposits. So in the center photograph there, you can see the, the mesh that she put them in and incubating them and then measuring the biodeposit production over two hour incubations along with the dissolved phosphorus release. And she got results similar to the previous graduate student, um, seeing that um, so on the left here, you see excretion of dissolved phosphorus and on the right, egestion of biodeposits. And uh, the scales are, are different on these two graphs, but essentially it shows the same thing that biodeposits can make up 50% even more of the phosphorus that mussels are releasing. So if we want to understand what mussels are doing to phosphorus cycling in Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes in general, we can't ignore these biodeposits. And if you look at various biogeochemical models, people have treated biodeposits in different ways. Sometimes they're completely ignored. Sometimes it's assumed that they're just uh, recycled immediately. Um, and uh, there's no clear way of how we should treat uh, this stuff in the models that we're developing. Um, and then Rayanne put this into a kind of an ecosystem context where she just came up with estimates of phytoplankton uptake of phosphorus in Lake Michigan, uh, and then estimates of zooplankton phosphorus recycling through zooplankton grazing, and then uh, her measurements of uh, muscle recycling, both as egestion and excretion. And the main point here is that, again, if you compare all these numbers, mussels are playing a big role in the phosphorus cycling of uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, they're consuming a large fraction of the phytoplankton production, uh, and then either excreting that in dissolved form or putting that out in um, particular form as biodeposits. And so uh, Rayanne did some more work to collect large amounts of biodeposits, which you see in the second image from the left here. Um, she would collect large amount. First, she would scrub the muscles, clean them off to make sure there's no biofilm uh, coming off of them. She'd get the biodeposits and then um, uh, concentrate them in a separatory funnel. And then she could uh, measure their mass and do some experiments with them. So uh, she did a bunch of um, batch experiments where um, she just wanted to look at how phosphorus was being recycled from uh, these biodeposits. 
So um, she had three different treatments on the far left is just putting bio deposits into a chamber and looking at um, phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus flux over time. And in some initial experiments with that, we found there was no dissolved phosphorus flux. We weren't seeing anything coming out of the bio deposits. So we decided, well, let's also do some where we add dissolved phosphorus to the chambers. So in the middle one there, you see bio deposits plus one micromole per liter of dissolved phosphorus. And then a control on the right, which was just filtered lake water with phosphorus added to it. And she would do um, fairly long-term experiments with these. She was doing multi-week experiments to see what was happening to the um, uh, bio deposits with and without phosphorus. And here see, you see some of her results. So the bottom line is just plain bio deposit. And this is monitoring the soluble reactive phosphorus over time. And you can see not really a lot happening when you just add the bio deposits. After about three weeks, you see a bit of a blip there in the blue line, but then it comes down again. But if you add phosphorus with the bio deposits, and that's the green line here, then you see after about four days, all of a sudden that phosphorus really starts to go down. So the bio deposits, at least initially, are not working as a, serving as a phosphorus source, they're serving as a phosphorus sink. And this phosphorus is just getting sucked out of the water column. Um, it was hard to go much longer than that because you can see in the control when you just have water and phosphorus, even after three weeks, the phosphorus starts to go down just to due to bacteria growing inside the uh, chambers. So that started to confound the experiments after a certain length of time. So it was hard to say over the long term, longer than three weeks, what happens to the bio deposits because um, you just got this, this chamber effect that confounded the results. Um, and then a, a colleague of hers did uh, just looked at bacteria in these samples. And here you can see that if you've got bio deposits, then you get an increase in the number of bacteria. But if you add phosphorus with the bio deposits, then you really increase the number of bacteria in the sample. So the bacteria are growing on these bio deposits and they're sucking the phosphorus out of the water column to support that growth. And this is looking at the actual mass of the bio deposits. And you can see that if you don't add phosphorus, the mass of the bio deposits does slowly go down over time. So there's some decomposition there. But again, if you add phosphorus with the bio deposits, then on the far right, you can see the mass goes way up. And most of that mass increase is due to bacteria growing on these bio deposits. So we wanna look a little further in the lake to see what was happening right on the bottom of the lake um, and what muscle excretion of, of both dissolved and particulate phosphorus was doing. So Ann put down these, um, these uh, series of uh, dialysis tubing uh, chambers to try to get measurements of profiles of dissolved phosphorus on the bottom of the lake. So you can see here this tubing that's been segmented. Uh, it's dialysis tubing, so it's semi-permeable. And if you leave it down there for a few days, it equilibrates with the water chemistry around the tubing. Uh, this is the system on the bottom of the lake. It's mounted on a larger frame that we had a particle image velocimetry system on, which I'm not showing here, but this just shows the tubing at the bottom of the lake where it sat for three days and then it was pulled back up. And then you extract the water from the various compartments and analyze the phosphorus in there. And this is some of the data that she got. So a couple of interesting points here is that um, you see the concentration of dissolved phosphorus getting up to about seven micrograms per liter. Ambient Lake Michigan is usually 0.5 micrograms per liter or lower. And it's impressive that these muscles are having an effect on the dissolved phosphorus concentration up to 50 centimeters off the bottom of the lake. So they're excreting a lot of dissolved phosphorus creating this boundary layer that's enriched in phosphorus on the bottom of the lake. But it's also kind of interesting if you look at the bottom two points that at least in this profile, it really dropped between those two points, which may be due to this biodeposit again, sucking phosphorus out of the water column as the bacteria are growing on that biodeposit. So the question was, well, um, are these biodeposits breaking down or are they, um, just sticking around? Are they uh, refractory? What's happening to them? So we developed a, a fairly simple um, model, just a, a reactor model um, of the lake, just to try to simulate what role the biodeposits might play in the phosphorus cycle. 
And what we could do with this model is play with different um, lifetimes or half lifetimes of the biodeposits on the bottom to see how that would affect uh, the phosphorus cycle in the lake as a whole. And here's some of the parameters for the model. And I just wanted to point out a couple of the parameters here. We built into the model a, um, a DK rate or a DK constant for biodeposits to simulate how fast they would degrade over time. And it, even that D, DK constant had a decay to it so that to simulate the biodeposits becoming more and more refractory over time to see uh, how that would affect uh, the phosphorus cycle in the lake. Um, so these are observed, these are the actual observed concentrations of both um, total phosphorus and dissolved and particulate phosphorus in the lake. And then we ran the model with different fractions of bio deposits being recycled from zero all the way up to one. And what we found with the model is that basically you have to, you have to recycle most of those biodeposits to create concentrations in the lake that are similar to what we're observing. Um, so even though we didn't see complete recycling within our three weeks experiments, the model suggests that over time, most of those bio deposits must be recycled or else you would be losing a lot of phosphorus from the water column in the lake. Um, so then you might ask, well, if most of the bio deposits are being recycled, does it really matter what's happening to bio deposits? Eventually it's all recycled anyways. And so we also use the model to look at the effect of um, the half-life of the biodeposits. So a half-life of zero is just the biodeposit being recycled immediately versus a long half-life where they're sitting on the bottom for a long time. And these results are a little surprising and a little counterintuitive, but they suggest that um, there's kind of this sweet spot of um, biodeposit half-life at, at about a two or three weeks where it actually uh, results in a maximum concentration of primarily particulate phosphorus in the water column, which in turn affects the total phosphorus concentration. So it's kind of weird. At, at a really low half-life or a really long half-life, it results in lower particulate phosphorus concentrations in the water column. But at this intermediate half-life, it actually results in higher concentrations. And interestingly, that higher concentration at a half-life of three to four weeks is very close to what we actually observe in the lake. We still have to play with this more. This is a very simple model. It's not accounting for stratification or seasonality and so forth, but it's helping us explore the uh, ramifications of biodeposits. Another side thing that we find in the model, which I think Mark has seen in his models as well, is that if you increase the amount of phytoplankton that are being grazed by the mussels, so this is the daily fraction of the water column that's filtered by mussels, you see uh, not so much a change in the total phosphorus concentration, but a change in the dissolved to the particulate phosphorus ratio. Um, as you get more muscle grazing, you get more dissolved phosphorus because they're putting out a lot of dissolved phosphorus, but the particulate phosphorus is going down mainly because the muscles are just grazing so much of the water column and removing that particular phosphorus from the water column. So this is all about quagga mussels. Why am I showing a picture of cichlids from Lake Malawi? Uh, well, if you go to uh, Lake Malawi, which is kind of the second half of my career, um, in the near shore of Lake Malawi, you have this diverse fish assemblage, and there's a lot of fish poop in this area. Um, you can see this particular fish has, a, he's, he's quite anal retentive, and um, uh, this was what a lot of fish do in the near shore zone and they produce a lot of these um, fish feces. And a number of years ago, even before I started working on quagga mussels, we were asking ourselves, what's the role of this fish feces in the near shore nutrient cycle? And we did the same thing with them. We got some of them, we incubated them, waiting to see the, how much nutrients were coming off of this fish manure. And we didn't see that. We saw that they were sucking nutrients out of the water column. So doing a very similar thing to what the quagga, quagga mussel um, biodeposits are doing. So, I guess my main point is, you know, we've had the quagga mussels for several decades now. We've been studying them a lot, and we understand in general terms what they're doing to the lakes. We know that they graze a lot of the phytoplankton, but I think we still don't completely understand how they're affecting the phosphorus dynamics in these lakes. Um, and as we're seeing here, biodeposits seem to play an important role in that. So whether you're looking at quagga mussels in Lake Michigan or cichlid fish in, in Lake uh, Malawi, the main point here is that poop matters. 
Um, so I'll finish it there. Thank you very much. All right, testing, does this work now? I can hear it. Uh, so thank you, Harvey. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, so. Stephanie. Oh, uh, I have two questions. One is a science question, another is uh, the other. Uh, your simple model can close the system. For example, if you run the model for multi years and the cycling back, yeah. back to the steady yeah, so, state. Yeah, so we do a kind of quality control and model where we do a mass balance. And uh, no matter how long you run it, the mass in the model is exactly equal to the, uh, so the only input is the external loading to the lake which it accounts for. Mm -hmm. And no matter how long you run it, um, it there's a mass balance there. Okay. Thank yeah. you. The second is that uh, the, the Great Lake fish edible because of the heavy metal? Is, is what edible? Are the, uh, are the Great Lake fish uh -huh. edible, edible? Uh, yeah, I think they are. <laughs> Certainly, this wouldn't affect them. The only concern there is, you know, there are contaminants in some of the larger fish that you have to be aware of. Nice talk, Harvey. I can't help but wonder, could you measure alkaline phosphatase down there and see if there's any enzymatic activity? And would it tell you something about what's going on? Enzymatic activity? Yeah, like alkaline phosphatase, because like that's what all the algae bacteria produce when they're hunting for phosphorus and right. just that up and down. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a good good idea to see if the, I don't know if they, they would have to in this case, because the SRP is so high down there, you know, up to seven micrograms per liter. Um, so they can just pull it out. But Another student now is working more, not so much on um, enzymes, but looking at uh, microbial composition in these beds and um, looking for genes that might be markers of certain um, phosphorus and nitrogen cycling processes. Uh, so that might provide us with more insight. Yeah, and some of those genes might show that there's alkaline phosphatase activity going on. <laughs> 